Hi, I'm Rich Folley. I'm here right now with Laura Kipnis, whose new book is called Men, Notes from an Ongoing Investigation. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to have you. Thank you. First of all, everything about this book um, struck me as um, a little bit comical in a way. You're, you're a funny person, and, and you're looking at men seriously, but with uh, a little bit of bemusement, it seems, as well, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, and irony. I mean, I think that women tend to take men at some level too seriously, but also not seriously enough. So I think, you know, the bemused attitude and stepping back from things and, you know, as, as opposed to just getting sucked into the drama. So I think that's what I'm, I'm trying to do. Yeah, you've written really stridently in the past about marriage and things like that. And yet in this book, I sensed almost empathy for males in the 21st century. Yeah, well, the word strident, I'm not sure <laughs> I, I like too much, but because I think um, with all the subjects that I take on, I actually try to approach the people, even badly behaved people, with empathy. So in Against Love, it was adulterers, and I kind of empathized with the position of somebody uh, straying from their, their marriage vows. And here, badly behaved men, I guess I'm trying to find points of identification. So, you know, never strident. Yeah, that, that's a wrong word. Me. I take strident back. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, the, the idea of badly behaved men is one that's really interesting. Are men behaving more badly today than they have in the past? Is there, we, we read about so many badly behaving men stories now. Mm -hmm. Are men behaving more badly than they used to? Well, I think there's more scrutiny, obviously, um, in the 24-hour news cycle that we hear about. But there just does seem to be a lot more psychodrama in public and men acting out these anxieties and acting out almost a kind of masochistic position. So that, to me, is very interesting as a social critic. Like, what is behind th the desire of these men, particularly men in, in highly placed positions, to almost enact their own shaming scenarios, to, to use the public, um, to, 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 sor to sort of bring them down, to punish themselves. So there is something that does seem different about this moment to me, and maybe men's uncertainty about what it is to be a man, about masculinity, about power, about male-female relations. Mm -hmm. So it's a great subject for that reason. It really is. There's so much to look at right now. When oh, tons. You, when you think about the, um, the strong male of Ernest Hemingway-style mm -hmm. man versus what Martin Amos wrote about in The Whimpers of Neglect of the New Man, um, it's such a shift in what people are looking for. It is confusing to be yeah, a man sometimes. Yeah. And I think if you go back and read some of those m male icons like Hemingway now, it's hard not to see the anxiety that underpins the, the writing. I mean, somebody like Hemingway is all about, you know, endlessly proving his, his masculinity, which, you know, has to signal a kind of anxiety about it. Yeah, and you see um, there's other examples of that when you have like Norman Mailer and others. Mm -hmm. and and, and they became almost caricatures or cartoonish yeah. in a way, that sort of wildly masculine character. Yeah, and Mailer was somebody who always felt himself embattled and, you know, under attack by feminists, you know, as he was, and, and fought back. So, um, I, but I, a lot of women find those kinds of guys very irritating or uh, offensive, but I, I think I, that's where the amusement comes in. And, and I also kind of identify with him. I mean, somebody like Mailer, who's so pugnacious, and but takes so many risks in his in his writing. You know, if I could take that many risks and and feel that much entitlement to, um, yeah, to, to just like put myself out there in the way he did. I mean, I would be a happy writer. Yeah. So I admire him, even though he's kind of crazy. <laughs> you, th there's well. other people like that that fit that description for you. Mm -hmm. You write about Larry Flint in the book, and maybe people wouldn't understand why or how, but you've been asked to write blurbs for him and you've done yeah. that. And tell me more about your relationship to Larry Flint and your feelings for him. Well, he was one of the early people that I wrote about and I had written this kind of, I have to confess, sort of ambivalently admiring essay about Hustler, which when I first read it, I found completely disgusting. And I mean, to the point that I, you know, like threw it across the room. And, but when I started actually reading it, it's, it's very interesting in terms of its class politics. It's very much about using disgust as this weapon against elites. So if you look back at um, satirists throughout history, like Rabelais even, you know, Hustler is, is kind of in that mode. So I wrote about it respectfully, but also about the ways that it triggered all my own shame and, uh, you know, protectiveness as a woman. Anyway, he ended up, somebody gave him this essay to read, 
And so I ended up um, meeting him. He invited me to meet him if I was in LA, which I did. And so we had these kind of interesting conversations across, you know, kind of huge gulf between us. We're quite different sorts of people. Um, but it was, you know, it was fascinating to meet somebody who I'd written about from this remove and uh, kind of test out my theories. And he ended up using stuff that I had written about him in this essay, or his ghostwriter did, put it in his own voice in his autobiography. So I felt like I had at least captured, I'd constructed this fantasy about who Larry Flint was, and he bought into it. You know, he, he, he liked that version of him. So I, you know, I did feel that that was some, I, you know, uh, form of approval from him, I guess. Yeah. Well, you've the other element that I that you write about in here that I was really fascinated by was the um, there's many, but the idea of heterosexual desire versus the sort of tenets of feminism, and the the inherent conflict that lives mm -hmm. in that, and and what that means for women, and usually what ends up coming out of the other end of that is some sort of disappointment because a man is invariably not going to live up to that, or maybe they're just confused by the combination of those two mm -hmm. things. I think women are in this very conflicted position in relation to men, and um, I think particularly in the aftermath of feminism, you know, there's a real, uh, there's a kind of desire to rebuke men, to be in this position of correcting them. You know, women have become habituated, and I include myself in this, to playing the role of scold and, and moral corrective and, you know, standing on the mountaintop, while at the same time, at least for heterosexual women, you know, desiring men as partners or, you know, lovers, fathers, um, you know, to find a man to make a com commitment to you. So it's, it's just very conflicted because women very much disapprove of men and want men to be different than they are, yet also want a man to, uh, you know, be with. Mm -hmm. And with things like social media today and all the other elements, it does seem like that there's a tentativeness for, for a lot of men. Um, there are some who can just sort of block it all out and do their thing. And a lot of people, uh, and they'll stumble and make mistakes, obviously. But for, for a lot of others, um, that idea of just being constantly watched and being judged is more apparent now than it's ever mm -hmm. been for mm -hmm. men. Yeah, yeah. And I, th I think in a way writing this book for me was to try to kind of get off that position of judging and find the points of identification and, you know, empathize as, a, as opposed to play the critic. So, you know, that was part of my interest in this book. I mean, it was sort of a self-examination as well as an examination of, of men. Mm -hmm. And a lot of your personality and styles in this book. Um, Thank the, you. Like the, uh, the chapters, when I, I joked with you earlier that I was intimidated, and I, I, I maybe <laughs> I am a little bit, but the, but, but the point is you're, uh -huh. you're Thank you're like, for that. You said we had, you had him on the run. Um, but the, the chapters, when you read chapters like The Scumbag, The Con Man, The Trespasser, Juicers, which for a second I thought might fit me. I had to read it first uh, to find oh out. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> a bit of a tippler? Yeah, maybe, I'm, maybe I should be embarrassed. <laughs> uh, but, the, you know, you read those, and, and, but inside those chapters, which you would think would be um, sort of putting you know, men on the defensive, is actually, as I mentioned earlier, sort of a more empathetic reading mm -hmm. from a distance. Like you were going into the wild, basically, to study the species of, of <laughs> Miller's man. It felt like that, yeah. And the juicers, I should say, is um, about uh, guys, athletes who use steroids, but I also try to connect that to other people in closer to my neck of the woods who use illicit substances, namely writers of memoirs and supposed nonfiction, like, say, James Fry of A Million Little Pieces, who also incorporate fictional experiences into nonfiction. So, you know, that was a form of juicing as well. And I try to, you know, make this connection about why are we taking these individuals and holding to them to these standards that we don't hold, like, their bosses to the same standards, like somebody like Lance Armstrong, you know, and his corporate sponsors, who will do anything that it takes to succeed in the marketplace, but the individual who does the same thing is, you know, subject to this endless scandal and that kind of thing. Right. So a lot of this book, too, is about you. I mean, there's yes. more of you in this book than I recall from your previous books. It's true. And you sort of ventured into this new territory. Was that uncomfortable for you? You know, it's interesting. I, I should say I was trying, I was in the middle of writing this book about narcissism, of all things, and I got very stuck <laughs> on it. And so, so when you wrote I, a book about yourself. Well, kind of. <laughs> it was like that, and I realized I've always been I, a bit, um, I suppose, standoffish about people who write in the first person, because I've always been an admirer of somebody like Susan Sontag, who, you know, wrote from that more Olympian critical distance. 
And so even though I'm like privately a bit addicted to memoirs and will read you know, all sorts of first person accounts, um, I had not really written much in the first person in Against Love. Uh, I wrote an entire book about love without using the first person once. So when I went back and I was revising these essays, I did weave in my own experiences mm -hmm. with men, both you know boyfriends or men I've known, and also my own kind of yeah sense of s empathy or identification, especially with some of these badly behaved mm -hmm. figures. It was it was fun. Mm -hmm. As a man reading the book, I I um, I wonder sometimes because some of the themes in here are pretty big, as if uh, man, as if some of people are consciously making decisions about how to behave, or that they're being sort of thoughtfully holding back or doing something incorrectly that's, that they were led to b by society. I wonder if men even think that hard. I mean, I sometimes wonder if I think that hard about the way that I'm behaving. I, I find myself in situations that are just me being dumb, frankly. Yeah, well, you know, it's been a theme that I've taken up uh, repeatedly. I, the last book I wrote was about scandal called How to Become a Scandal. And this question about consciousness and how conscious you are, fully self-aware of your actions is, I guess I'm kind of plagued by it. So the people who get themselves into scandals and everybody says, you know, how could they have been so stupid? I mean, what you have to realize or you end up having to realize is that we're all just very split. You know, there's, I think it's the structure of consciousness that you can know something and not know it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to rebuke the people, I mean, like I write about, say, Anthony Weiner, who was a congressman, you know, sent the, sent the sex uh, to, to various women. Um, and you think, didn't you know what you were doing? And I think the fear is that you yourself, I myself, could step in a pot, you know, the same kind of pile of whatever uh, in a similar way by sort of not exactly paying attention even while knowing that you're doing something. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think that is human, what mm -hmm. it is to be human. That's fascinating. And you're not intimidating at all. Um, your book is <laughs> really interesting, though. That's a, I, I love the way you have put it. Thank you. Yeah, and it's really uh, great to talk to you. Laura Kipnis, the book is Men, Notes from an Ongoing Investigation. I'm sure that investigation will continue. Yes, maybe a sequel. Yeah, maybe you'll be a footnote. There you go. Hey, <laughs> all right. But it's great to meet Thanks. you. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much.